Are you ready, Sister Antoinette? Um, we're ready. Let's see the video showing. I'm not seeing the video at all. Good afternoon, everyone. Those of you who have joined, I am just seeing the picture of the individual, Sister Antoinette. I'm not seeing the video itself. Sister you have to Antoinette? introduce your program, sis, and then she do the video. Okay, okay. So good afternoon to each and everyone. It's a good thing to know that we can come together again to listen to yet another presentation by Sister Barbara O'Neill, and today's topic is, will be part 11 of herbs. And we just thank God that he has given us herbs because according to his words, they're for the healing of the nation. And so many times we have so much herbs in our gardens and all around the place, but we don't know its use, its medicinal use and so many other uses we just don't know. So this evening, we are going to listen to some of the identification as to what some of these herbs look like and what they are going to do, or what are, their, what are their uses, what they look like and what are their uses. And just to give you an introduction, it says a herb is a plant or part of a plant used for its scent, its flavor or its therapeutic properties. Herbal medicines are one type of dietary supplement. They are used as tablets, they can be used as capsules, they can be used as powders, teas, extracts, or fresh or dried plants. And we realize also that people use these herbal medicines to try to maintain or to improve their health. So at this time, we are now going to listen to the presentation by Barbara O'Neill on herbs. She will not be able to touch on all because as I said, this is the 11th um, edition of Herbs. And so she's going to, not edition, sorry, the 11th part or part 11 of her presentation on Herbs. So at this time, do enjoy, call up a friend so that we can all share and learn from this experience. So before she comes on, let us offer a word of prayer. Kind Father, which art in heaven, Lord, we bless your holy name. We just want to give you praise and thanks for who you are. And we pray, oh dear God, that as we, we listen to these interesting um, talk about herbs, we pray, oh dear Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit will guide and direct all that we do and all that we say. Grant us your peace as we now learn, I pray, in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Yesterday, we talked about how we're going to do the sodium bicarbonate wrap. Um, and this is the wrap that we do to help people conquering cancer. It's quite an involved wrap, so we're going to do the whole setup in the break. And in this first lecture, I'm going to talk about herbs. But the herbs I'm going to talk about are things that you probably have always seen as just weeds in the garden. And an important part of um, 
knowing about your weeds in the garden or your herbs is being able to identify them. But not only that, to know what you do with them, how you can use them and why they would help you and in what area they would help you. So I'm going to start with one that I'm not going to touch and you'll know why I'm not going to touch it because it is stinging nettle and I found this wonderful um, specimen this morning. Stinging nettle. Did you know that in the in the little cottage gardens when people first settled in is that wind? <laughs> when when Australia was first settled, the English colonies, and they had gardens, they always had a bed of stinging nettle. And stinging nettle can be used for uh, in a stew, you can use it like spinach, and you, we want rubber gloves on it, really thick rubber gloves, and you cut it up and you put it in your stew. And as soon as it cooks, it limps. And when it limps, of course you've got no more of the prickly things, and also it um, annuls, so to speak, the, the stinging of it. But if you are weeding in the garden and the nettle does touch you, there is a remedy, and it is DOC. And DOC is the remedy for if you get touched by stinging nettle. And often you will find them growing together, which that was very nice of God to do, <laughs> is to grow them together. And if you do touch the stinging nettle, and it certainly stings. I think one of the worst one I had one day, I was in my garden and there was a, a celery plant gone to seed. And I knew that it was going to take a lot of strength for me to pull this out. I'd already loosened it with a fork, so I grabbed it hard, knowing I'd have to pull it hard, and guess what was growing right next to it? <laughs> was stinging that all. So it wasn't just a a brush or a touch, it was a grab, ah, oh, that was a mighty sting and it was all inside here and it kills. <laughs> Do you know the stinging, the stinging nettle is, a, is the same as in the, in the ants, the ants that sting, it's actually the same chemical. And I'm looking around and I saw it and I grabbed it and you just chew, 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 spit out because it's the juice juice of the dock. So I grabbed the dock and I chewed it and chewed it and spit it out and then I held my hand. Oh, it's incredible the relief that it gives. And if you really want to know the leaf, you can come up and touch it and then we'll quickly get the dock. But there's only a little bit of, there's only a little bit of dock. <laughs> but the juice in the dock will, will bring relief and negate the sting from the stinging nettle. So why would you use stinging nettle? Stinging nettle's roots go deeper than any other root. And because the roots go so deep, they are able to access minerals way down deep in the earth. That The top plants can't actually access the minerals that the roots get if they're way down deep. So this stinging nettle, and you can almost tell because it is so dark green, you see the darker the green, the higher the mineral content. So at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, we serve our guests breakfast like a king and lunch like a queen and tea like a pauper. And so the evening um, drink that we give our guests is broth and we cook onions with the skin on it and potatoes with the skin and celery and all the celery leaves and we slowly cook that for about four hours and in the last half hour we'd put stinging nettle in and for a uh, maybe five, six litre pot, we'd put about that much stinging nettle in. And then before we serve it, we strain it. So all the minerals that are in all those vegetables and all the minerals that are in that stinging nettle go into the water. So I say to our guests, aren't you glad we don't ask you to eat stinging nettle? We just <laughs> drink the water from it. So all the minerals that are in the plants are now in the broth. So we strain that and what we strain out is it's basically not good for much because all the minerals are now in the water. And I know an old Aussie habit, the ladies used to 
cook their veggies on a Sunday and cook their roast and then the water from the vegetables they would make their gravy with that was a because it gives a nice flavor you know what the flavor is the flavor is minerals so before we serve our broth we put a couple of spoons of Celtic salt in it and our guests love that broth at night it really is what women used to uh, call stock yeah in the, you know, they'd have their big old uh, fuel stove and a big pot and they'd cut up their carrots and put the tops and the ends in and they cut up their onion and put the onion skins in. That's basically what we do. First two days at Misty Mountain Health Retreat are juicing days. So we just put the veggies together. But on the cooking days, there's always a broth pot in the kitchen. And, you know, when the parsley is being cut up, all the sticks from the parsley they put in the broth and it, it's the best stock so you you know feel free to do that feel free to put your stinging nettle in make a nice big broth pot because then you can freeze it in little containers and it's a great base for soups great base for cooking your legumes and a great evening meal is just having that cup or two of broth very high in minerals um, the nettle is also reported to help with the inflammation of the prostate gland the nettle being very, very high in minerals is high in iron, so it's very good for people who are a little bit challenged with anemia. But you know, the main cause of anemia is low hydrochloric acid, and tonight, in my lecture on the gut, I'm going to show you how you can boost hydrochloric acid levels to, to heal anemia, to help get that iron out of the food. So that's what you would use stinging nettle for. The next one we're going to look at is chickweed. And I found some very good specimens of chickweed. Now chickweed looks very, very similar to radium. Yep, you, you probably can hardly see the difference there. So there is a way to tell the difference. And with the chickweed, it'll have one little rootstock and the plant can spread right out about this big. In fact, if I've got chickweed in my garden, I know all I have to do is go underneath, find the root, and I've got all of that away. It'll spread out. Now, the identifying factor with chickweed, and you can come up in the break. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but when you break the chickweed stem, there's a thread in there. So that's held together because there's a little thread inside the stem. So that's the identifying um, factor with chickweed. And chickweed is a delightful herb. Um, feel free to come up and have a chew of the leaf. It is not bitter at all, so it's very, very nice in your salads. My first husband was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I had six children in the rainforest, no electricity. Sometimes times were a bit tough, and there was not a lot of money around. In fact, when times were tough, we ate lentils and chickweed, <laughs> and we did very well. So the chickweed can be thrown in your soups and your stews, and all the minerals will go in there. But you can see how the leaf is not as dark as the stinging nettle. It still has some iron, it still has some minerals, but it has quite a shallow root. I don't think I picked any root there. But um, medicinally, the chickweed is an anti-itch herb. And I know when my children had contact with chickenpox or measles, you know, the next few days we're weeding in the garden and my daughter Emma would say, leave the chickweed, mum, we're going to leave, we're going to need that. <laughs> and for um, measles, chickenpox, you know, itchy things, you can pour boiling water on it and the tea, when it cools, you can put into ice, ice trays. So you've got chickweed tea ice cubes. And when someone has an itch, they get that out, and you know what ice will do to itch? <laughs> so if ever you've got an itch, don't scratch it, because when you scratch an itch, it brings relief. But then what does it do? <laughs> it's even worse. And if the scratching continues, the skin can break, and if the skin breaks, then an infection can come. Whenever you feel itch, grab an ice cube and just hit it. Now, the beauty of making chickweed tea ice cubes, you've got a, a double effect of not only the ice to kill the itch, but you've also got the herb. Um, if someone has chickenpox measles, you can make a bath and throw a heap of chickweed in the bath. <laughs> and 
and they can bathe in the chickweed bath. Would you use it for a psoriasis? You certainly can. You certainly can. Now, psoriasis has a yeast um, aspect too, this, the rash on the skin. So you could warm up coconut oil in a double saucepan and you could put the chickweed in it. And you do that for probably about half an hour till the chickweed goes all limp and dark like it's cooked. And then you just pick the chickweed out. Now you've got chickweed ointment. And the, the coconut oil has an anti-fungal property, anti-yeast property. So that's an excellent ointment for uh, things like eczema and, um, and psoriasis. You've got your anti-itch of the, of the chickweed and you've also got the, the antifungal property of the coconut oil. Can you see that? That will actually stay there. If I pull that hard, I can break that little inside thread. But that little thread in the middle is your identifying factor. So that's the main thing with chickweed. It can be eaten. It's got nice <clears throat> nice ray of minerals in it and uh, it's anti-itch. Now I have to tell you too that my children were um, exposed to chicken pox measles five times and they never got it. We'd get all the chickweed ready and, and they would never get it. And I was talking to a naturopath one day, I said it's really funny my children keep getting exposed, everyone gets it, my children don't. He said I know why, he said your children are running barefoot through the hills they're eating all the food out of the garden, which is incredibly high in minerals and nutrients. He said their bodies are functioning so well, it's not taking them down. He said, I wouldn't be surprised if your children did get it, but it was so mild that they didn't even know they had it. Isn't that interesting? That was his theory. Now let's have a look at this other one, and this is called radium. Radium's the one that looks like chickweed. And this is very different because it's just like a little tree. It doesn't spread out like the chickweed. And I was looking around, I thought that was quite a good specimen till I found this one. And you see it branches out. But as you can see, it's so similar, isn't it? So to identify it, um, you know that this is the radium because it grows like a tree and that one spreads out. But the identifying factor is, when you break it, break it. Can you see the white milk? There's a white milk there, and that white milk is an irritant. So don't put this one in your salad. <laughs> okay? It's an irritant. Your husband will never forgive you. Now you see that white, that white milk there. You can put that on a skin cancer and burn it out. You can put that on a wart and burn it out. You can put that on a mole and burn it out. It's an irritant. It's, it'll irritate whatever you put it to. So what you can do is you can put a little bit of olive oil or coconut oil um, or purple ointment, something like that, around the edge of the mole or wart or skin cancer and just put that on the, on the skin cancer, wart or mole. It'll flare up. It's an irritant. It's doing its work. It'll look terrible, but that's what it does. If you go and have a skin cancer burnt off from the doctor, it's going to look terrible, isn't it? <laughs> it's just burning it out. So remember, this one is an irritant. Don't eat it. But you can irritate or burn out any little bits and pieces on your body that you'd like to burn out. So that's really the only thing that you would use the radium for. It's also called milkweed because of that little dot of milk that comes out. Obviously the thicker the stem, the, the, the better milk that you will get. Now we're going to have a look at, uh, here's another one. Now this is sorrel. And I'll draw the leaf. a bit pointy. So the, 
The identifying with sorrel is it has those two little lobes at the bottom and sometimes, sometimes it'll have another little dip there. So what we've already looked at is chickweed. We've also looked at um, radium. And remember the chickweed's the nice one with the little thread and the radium that has the milk in it. And we've also looked at stinging nettle. A friend of mine is German and he says that he makes stinging nettle salad. I said you make stinging nettle salad. And what he does is he cuts it up really, really tiny. I've yet to eat it. <laughs> yes, that's nettle tea. Yeah, nettle tea, and you'll find, um, if you find a mix for, say, the prostate, you'll often have nettle in it. And the other thing nettle is used for is, um, it's high in iron, so often if people are anemic, they'll use nettle tea. If you get a herb book, you'll find many herbs have got a whole lot of things you can do, but I like to target the specifics, because there are some herbs that are specifically better for certain things than others. Last night I talked about the hawthorn berry, <coughs> and the hawthorn berry is a specific for the heart. Cayenne pepper is a specific for the blood, and that's good news, that means it can be used all over the body. In fact, in the book Curing with Cayenne, the author Sam Beiser, he says you can put cayenne pepper with other herbs to increase their, their potency. So you could put cayenne pepper with, with hawthorn berry to increase the hawthorn berry's f action on the heart. And you can put um, cayenne pepper with something like uh, cranberry, which will help to increase the cranberry's ability to help resolve uh, UTI, or urinary tract infections. So what do you use sorrel for? Um, sorrel is one of those green herbs, and there are many of them, that is, a, that is like a sweet bitter. So if you chew on the sorrel, it almost has a sweet aftertaste, but it's a, a slightly bitter. And all your bitter herbs are specifics for your liver. And all your green herbs are very high in chlorophyll and chlorophyll is plant blood and the molecular structure of chlorophyll is very similar to the molecular structure of human blood. Let me show you. So this is the molecular structure of human blood and this is the molecular structure of plant blood which is chlorophyll. So there's the plant and there's the human almost identical, almost. The middle molecule in plant is magnesium and the middle molecule in human is iron. And that's why the, the green drinks, the um, green barleys, green smoothies, all your green plants, except for the radium, <laughs> you can use to boost, boost iron in the blood. Also, green juice, which is your plant blood, it's one of the most potent blood and tissue cleansers in the body. It cleanses the tissues. So sorrel, throw it in your salads, it's quite nice. Buzz it up in your green drinks, very nice. Now there's one that you probably would not want to put in your green drinks, definitely not the radium, and that is dandelion. Now I was able to get quite a few different specimens of dandelion and the way to identify dandelion is the lion has sharp teeth and so on the edge of the dandelion there's very sharp edges. Now those edges don't look very sharp. I found this one um, right underneath a bush 
And look at this leaf here, it hardly even looks like a dandelion leaf. But if you look closely, you can see those little edges. But I was able to find, a, it's got a bit of dirt in it. This one was near the front door. And can you see the leaves are very sharp there? And you would wonder if that and that was the same plant, wouldn't you? But you see, grown in different areas, this was more sun exposed and weather exposed, whereas this one was more underneath the bushes. So the identifying factors with the dandelion are these sharp, sharp corners. Remember dandelion, the lion's teeth. So that's dandelion. Now there is another herb that looks very similar to dandelion. It's called catsia. Now with the dandelion, the dandelion plant will just shoot up one stalk with one flower, whereas the cat's claw will shoot up several stalks and the stalk will divide and it'll have several flowers. I couldn't see a cat's ear, but I did. Ah, oh, yes, I did. I found in the grass the dandelion stem. Now the dandelion stem See, the dandelion and the cat's ear flower look very similar. They're both yellow, but the dandelion flower will be a little bit bigger. So you'll know which is which by the stem. And the dandelion stem is hollow. My children used to pick them and use them as straws. <laughs> so the dandelion stem is hollow. And also, the cat's ear stem is not. It's sort of more disjointed. And again, in fact, I'll draw a picture of it. We'll rub this one out. So with the dandelion, it's it's definitely it's it's got the sharp leaves, and then you'll have lots of leaves here, and it'll just have one stem that'll go straight up, and it'll have the flower on top. Whereas the cat's ear, the the leaves are more like this. They're more round, they're not sharp, but they're very similar. They have all the leaves around like that, but they'll have a stem that'll go like that, and they'll have the yellow flower on it like that. And sometimes they have another one that, that divides like that, and it'll have the flower up like that. Once you start looking, you'll be able to identify the difference. Another big difference between the cat's claw and the dandelion is not only the sharp edges, but dandelion is smooth, whereas cat's claw is a little bit furry. Now, as, as far as the east is from the west is the medicinal properties. Cat's claw, it's basically only good thing about it is it's a green plant. <laughs> whereas dandelion, Lion is the king of the jungle, and I think dandelion is the king of the, the herbs in the garden, because dandelion is a bitter herb. If you were to, to bite it and eat it, it's, it's very, very bitter. And you've heard the old saying, sweet to the mouth, bitter to the stomach. Sweet to the mouth, bitter to the stomach. Think of that with sugar. Sugar is sweet to the mouth, but very bitter to the stomach. Whereas your bitter herbs like dandelion, they're bitter to the mouth but very sweet to the stomach because it's the bitter herbs that stimulate the liver to release, to release its um, digestive enzymes. And also it can, the bitterness causes the stomach to release its digestive enzymes too. Dandelion is the liver herb. Your liver is a recoverable organ. It's the only organ in the body that has the ability to regrow or recover. That's why they can do a liver transplant on just a little bit of liver and the, the liver will regrow. And I'm so glad made that God made the liver a recoverable organ because some of the things that people are doing to their body, in ignorance, mostly granted, if we didn't have a recoverable organ, some of us wouldn't even live past our 20s. But God in his great wisdom and mercy made the liver to be a recoverable organ. And these herbs help stimulate the liver to regrow and to recover. 
Cancer cannot get a hold on the body if the liver's working in optimum performance. And one, one liver herb that many people don't realize it is, is the lemon. So a great drink in the morning, remember you wake up, have your water, have another bit of water, and then when you come near the kitchen, have the kettle boiled and put juice of a lemon in some water with a little bit of boiling water on top and have a warm lemon drink. Fantastic uh, liver tonic early in the morning. Also, the lemon is an internal alkalizer, so that will do a, two, a few things too. Now, how can we eat this? How can we eat the dandelion? Well, there's a recipe in Europe. A friend of mine went through Europe traveling for a while and she stayed at some of her relatives because she is German descent. And she said that they make this wonderful hot potato salad. They cook the potatoes and then they chop them up hot into hunks and then they chop up heaps of dandelion and then they put lots of olive oil, crushed garlic and salt. Just imagine that. Doesn't that sound yum? Now those smooth um, blandish potatoes covered with the delicious olive oil that makes anything taste nice and that also calms down the garlic and it and it also calms down the bitterness of the dandelion. So every mouthful you eat is mostly potato with that lovely oil on it and salt and a little garlic and a little bit of dandelion. It's actually delicious. It sort of balances out to a delicious hot potato salad. Now this lady suffered from mind problems. She said, I had no iron challenges when I was in Europe. She said, I think I was, it's because I was eating the hot potato dandelion salad every day. Sorry, I can't give you amounts there, yes? <laughs> this is a German man, am I right? <laughs> I forgot the vinegar. Well, I actually don't put vinegar on it. I, I like it just, just like that. But, um, so I've got a confirmation that that is a recipe from Germany. Yes, 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 it is. So that's one way you can have it, because remember it is bitter. You can slice them up finely and you can thread, you can just sprinkle them through a salad with your sweet, your sweet lettuce. The other way you can have dandelion is you can use the root. Now there's a book you can buy, it's by an Australian woman. It's called How I Can Use Herbs in My Everyday Life and it's by an Isabel Shepherd. And it's a great book because her book has all the garden weeds in it. And she says that the dandelion root, now this is why I was glad I got the root. Now that's not a very old plant, but the root is quite long. And she says, when you first make a garden, before you've got time to put all the fertilizer in it, plant dandelion in your garden. And she said the root can go to even a meter deep and it'll break up the soil. So when I first moved where I'm living now, the house that I lived in, the hill had been cut into to be able to build the house. But what does that mean? My house is just on clay. So I took my grandchildren, my three little granddaughters, and we went on a dandelion hunt all through the grass in the property where the health center is. And they would run, I found one, Grandma! And they'd find the little, little um, flowers sitting on top because they just poke straight up. And when you see that flower, you dig deep. And we dug up the dandelions and we went and planted it all through my garden. So all through my garden is dandelion because I wanted those roots to go very deep and break up the clay that my house was sit on. In fact, people look at my garden now and they don't know why it looks so good because it is clay. But I've, I've done a few things to it. That, that always helps. And I've put wood, wood chips on. Do you, ever, do you use wood chips? Wood chips are great. Do you know why? Wood chips cause the growth of a fungi called mycorrhiza. And mycorrhiza has hyphae that go out that pull nutrients from deep down in the soil into the soil where your plants are, mycorrhiza. I think it's called I think that's it, mycorrhiza, it's a fungi. 
and it grows in wood chips. That's why wood chips are so great around your fruit trees. Put it as deep as you can, the weeds won't come, it'll keep the moisture there, but it'll encourage the growth of, or the development of mycorrhiza. Um, I actually think the spelling's really wrong. So I'm gonna try again. And I just realized what it is, it's mycorrhiza. That's it. You see, myco means fungi, mycorrhiza. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So she can use the leaves all through her salad and she can go on a little hunt with her grandchildren to find the... <laughs> Not many people will believe that you're digging up the dandelion and putting it in your garden. How many people are pulling it out of their garden? <laughs> and, but it doesn't take over the garden. You know, all my flowers, they're all... In fact, I've got a strange garden. I've got roses, and I've got celery, and I've got kale, and I've got pansies, and I've got weeds that people think are weeds, all growing all through my garden. They're the gardens I love. Now, what you can also do, you can buy... Um, you can buy the dandelion root that's been roasted. So that's like a dandelion coffee. And you can buy a delicious drink in the health food shop, and we sell it at Misty, called Chai Dandelion. A lot of people will drink chai tea, but the tea, of course, has the tannin and the caffeines in it. But Chai Dandelion is a delicious drink. A lot of people don't like herb teas because they say they're tasteless and bland. Not Chai Dandelion. Chai Dandelion is a delicious drink and it has a whole lot of herbs and spices with it to make, give it that beautiful flavour. So um, you can have the fresh dandelion scattered through your salads or you can make your hot potato salad with lots of dandelion in it, the leaves, or you can uh, buy the dandelion root roasted and uh, have that as a, as a hot drink. Now I've got a couple of herbs that I have not got here but I will talk about and one is aloe vera. I'm sure everyone's familiar with aloe vera. Every home should have a pot of aloe vera and I know that aloe vera doesn't like frost and I think you have frosts here. But you can grow it in a pot we have frost at our place and what you've got to do is, you know, an aloe vera plant will give off little pups. You've got to plant a little pup there and you've got to let plant a little pup there and a little pup around there and you've got to find out where, it, where it's happy. And you, when you find a place that it is happy, then you grow a whole crop of it. Now why would you grow aloe vera? Gla aloe vera has a growth stimulant in it. So aloe vera stimulates rapid new cells. So that's good news, isn't it? And aloe vera is a little bit slimy. We know it's a little bit slimy. So it's very good at coating, soothing and healing the lining of the gut. So great if you've got sore throat, great if you've got stomach ulcer, fantastic for uh, irritable bowel, Crohn's disease. The inside of your gastrointestinal tract is like the inside of your, your mouth. It's sort of a bit slimy, and aloe vera is like that. So how do we eat it? Well, I'll tell you a bit of a funny story. It's an embarrassing story, but I'll tell it to you because it gives an illustration. I was in Mount Isa, and I was lecturing and I'd been travelling a lot and when you travel a lot you're breathing in, car in a lot of plane fumes and I got a very sore throat and I went to bed this night and my throat was very sore and I thought if I can just fall asleep I'll be fine. I was having a bit of salt, I was having water and I woke in the middle of the night and I could not even swallow, it was like razor blades. My throat was like razor blades and I lay there thinking, what am I going to do? You know, when you've got so much, the pain is such that you can't sleep. But some pain's not too bad and you fall asleep, then you don't even know you've got pain. 
Now the house I was living in had a huge aloe vera patch. I was, um, yes, I, I, there was an upstairs place but I was downstairs and I knew it was outside and it was, it was probably, my door was there, a little path and then there was this huge aloe vera patch and aloe vera plants this wide, huge big aloe vera plants. The old ones are the most potent, they're the ones that are the best. And all I could think of was, if I can get that aloe vera gel in my throat, it'll bring me relief. So just picture me with my nightie on and a head torch, <laughs> creeping around three o'clock in the morning, and there it was, and I had a knife. And I just cut it, I cut the stem, then I cut it down the middle, and I just ate it. <laughs> Sounds very primitive, doesn't it? <laughs> It was a very thick leaf, so it was very fleshy. Oh, and it was a little bitter, but I did not care because my throat was so sore. Do you know, it brought almost instant relief. So you had to eat the whole lot? No, I did not eat the whole lot. I ate the fleshy centre. <laughs> that fleshy centre. So I'm here to testify, as you can see, I'm still alive. I just got my teeth into that into that flesh. Yes, it's not very civilised and it's very primitive. And I wonder what someone would have thought if they'd walked past and seen this lady in her nighty. <laughs> I told you it was a bit embarrassing. I went back to bed with a relieved throat. Now it wasn't totally gone, but the, that, that real razor blade had just been taken off and I slept that night. The, the best leaves are the biggest leaves. So what you can do, of course, when you're civilised, you can peel, heavily peel the leaf. Now you want to heavily peel the leaf because just under the leaf is a yellow sap. If, if you're familiar with aloe vera, you'll be familiar with that yellow sap. That yellow sap is an irritant to the gut. So you don't want the yellow sap. If you've got constipation, you might like the yellow sap because it certainly can stimulate movement down there. And so you cut off that thick, you do a thick cut of the leaf so you get the yellow slime underneath and then you're just left with the, the hunks of clear aloe, aloe vera juice or the, the aloe vera gel. So when I gave, two days later, I gave a lecture on the herbs, I got some of those big leaves and I heavily peeled them and I just had little sections of the gel and I invited the people to come up and have a taste. <laughs> and you just chew it a little bit in your mouth and ah, yes, it slimes down your throat. But that sliminess is what the lining of the gastrointestinal tract loves. So what we do now at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, because I thought, how can we use this aloe vera? It is so good. Now there's a polysaccharide and polysaccharide means many sugar. There is a special type of polysaccharide that is in the aloe vera that stimulates cell-to-cell -cell communication. And cell-to-cell -cell communication is important because when cell-to-cell -cell communication is working as it should, it won't allow cancer cells to get a hold on the body. Cancer cells get a hold on the body when cell-to-cell -cell communication has actually been compromised and the body doesn't know there's a problem cell there. Can you see that? But if cell-to-cell -cell communication is vibrant, then a cancer cell basically can't get a hold on the body because the communication system says there's a problem there. White blood cells deal with him. Have you heard of Manatech? Manatech is a company that sells a whole lot of products. All their products are based on aloe vera and they push the growth stimulant and they push that these products help with cell to cell communication which helps to keep check on cancer cells and even turn around cancer cells. So that's why Manatech um, push that and basically all their products are from aloe vera and that's what aloe vera does. It, it, that polysaccharide stimulates cell to cell communication but the growth stimulant of the aloe vera and also coat, soothe in, and heal the lining. So they're your three specifics with the aloe vera. So what we do, and I got this message out of um, Isabel Shepherd's book, How I Can Use Herbs in My Everyday Life, and you cut one of the big outer leaves of the aloe vera and then you sit it on a plate. 
and you sit it on a plate for one hour and all the yellow slime um, drains out. You'll see after an hour that pool of yellow slime. I cut the bottom off and then I slice it so that each slice is a few millimetres apart and then you'll put you know, one big leaf into a two litre jug of water and you let that sit and you drink the water. And if it has a little bit of an aloe vera taste, you put a sprig of mint in, that, that makes it even nicer. And you leave it there and after about six hours you just start drinking it. And so that's what I drink a lot at Misty Mountain, is um, the aloe vera juice. And we have carafes of water for our guests and we have always have several carafes of aloe vera. It looks really pretty, is the slices of, of thin aloe vera in the water. It does have a little bit of an aloe vera taste, but you know, I don't mind that. And if you mind it, you can put a squeeze of lemon in or you can put a sprig of mint in. After 24 hours, um, all the water's drunk, you can fill it up with water again. So you can actually use that for 48 hours. But what we do at Misty Mountain, we cut the leaf the night before, the staff slice it up and put it in the water and then in the morning our guests all get a glass of aloe vera water with a squeeze of lemon in it. Now that aloe vera does something else too, it has a natural probiotic in it. So I never wash my aloe vera leaf because B12 is an airborne bacteria. So none of these have been washed. So I only wash it if it's got mud or maybe manure on it, or I'd be very cautious if you picked a plant that may have had a dog do something on it, or the council spray it. So, you know, I wouldn't eat that, but then of course that must be washed. But this fresh from the garden with all the rain yesterday, there is no need to wash it. B12 is an airborne bacteria, so if I eat all that, and I just might eat that at lunchtime, unless you'd like it and you can eat it for your lunch, I'm getting a little bit of B12 because B12 is an airborne bacteria. So on the aloe vera, I've just picked it. There is no need to wash it. I sit it, let the yellow slime come out, cut the bottom and then slice it and put it in the water. There's B12 in that water. No, I don't peel it. If I'm just going to eat the gel, I peel it. But there's no need to peel it because the yellow slime has come out and I cut, it, I cut it all up. So in that water, you're getting all the properties of the aloe vera. Do you know after 24 hours, the water's getting a little thick? I don't mind. <laughs> but you're, you're getting that nice slime going down through your gut, and you're getting aloe vera, and you're getting a bit of B12, and you're also getting um, some probiotics, some natural probiotics. You've probably noticed that I love remedies that are very cheap. Now, last night I talked about the Anna's Wild Yam Cream. That's about $50 a jar, but it lasts three months. That's still pretty cheap, isn't it? I know people that spend $200 a month on supplements. So $50 over three months, that's, that's not hard. When you save money on these things, you can spend more money on good quality clothes, that are made out of natural fibre, good quality shoes that are made out of natural fibre. And you can also spend more money on organic fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts and seeds. You see, uh, it's not, as my husband always says, it's not how much money you've got, it's how, what you do with it, how you, <laughs> how you organise it around. So that's what you can do with aloe vera. Now a friend of mine, she drains the aloe vera and then she slices the aloe vera and she puts it on trays in the dehydrator. And when it's totally dried out, she blends it and puts it in a jar and she travels with it and she puts a spoonful in her water. <laughs> so that's something else that you can do um, with aloe vera. Well, that just about covers my herbs, unless there's any questions. Yes. What about Doc? Yeah. Now, now Doc, Doc um, hasn't any great specifics except that it's a green herb, so it's got that great chlorophyll in it. It has a, it's almost got a bit of a flavour like, um, 
like your sorrel. But dock's a great green herb and um, you could correct me, my German friends, do you eat dock in Germany? No, not, not dock so much. See, not dog. It um, yeah. It's if you look in the herb books, it's not not a, a great specific. Um, oh, it can take over. I wouldn't let this take over. Whereas the dandelion, it really behaves itself. It sort of keeps. But I I know in a very good soil, you can get a dandelion leaf that long and that fat when it's in good soil. So the doc, it, we do sometimes put it in the green drinks. You could put it in broth for a bit more green, and, um, but it's not as powerful as the stinging nettle. The stem of the stinging nettle is the antidote for the sting of the stinging nettle. Oh, well, that's good to remember. Problem is, it's a bit hard to get to the stem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's good to know. We live in a rainforest and we have stinging trees and the stinging tree is, is a very bad sting and the antidote, antidote for the leaves being stung by the leaves of the stinging tree and they're like this, is you scrape the, the tree and get the sap and that'll do that. So I guess that's similar to the, to the stinging now. So the milkweed, this one. Oh, there we are, the milkweed. Okay, I'll try that next time. So the milk, the milk from the milkweed, the radium, will also negate the sting of the stinging now. That's good to know, yes? Um, could you put them into a blender? What we do at Misty Mountain Health Retreat when someone comes to us wanting help to conquer cancer, we will put the edible greens, we put this, we actually put the stinging nettle because it's not bitter, we put that, we might put a little bit of that, we don't do the dandelion because it's so bitter, and I'll do um, tips from the pumpkin plant, um, we also uh, will do um, uh, farmer's friend, you know farmer's friend sticky beaks? You know when you go in the garden and you get all those sticky things? Oh, it's oh, called yeah. sticky beaks, yeah, farmer's friend. So all your edible greens that aren't too bitter, we blend. We usually blend with water. Um, say four cups of greens and four cups of water, we blend it and then we strain it and we put it in little bottles and so it's dark green water. And we usually put either mint or um, lemongrass in so it doesn't taste too bad. And our guests who come to us to conquer cancer, they drink a litre of that in the day. So that's, that's part of their water. So that's what we do. Some people uh, do green drinks, um, green smoothies I should say. And they'll have um, you know, almond milk and a banana and... Um, chia seeds and so they blend maybe some protein powder and then they'll put um, kale leaves in and they'll drink that. So that's, that's uh, you know, there are whole books on green smoothies. Some of our guests, they're too busy in the morning to eat so they just make green smoothies. So they're quite popular. Yes? Well, you can eat it but if you're finding that hard, you just rub it between your hands and get the juice out. That's probably more civilised. You can roast it yourself, yep. But as you can see by this one, you wouldn't get much out of that one. You'd have to have one that's a few years old to make your own dandelion root, yes? So kale. What are the benefits of kale? What are the benefits of kale? Kale is a lovely dark green leafy vegetable. It does help the liver. It's not as potent as the dandelion, but it does. It does. Um, and being green, high in chlorophyll, it's a blood and tissue cleanser. Yeah, all your greens are high alkalizers. So it's basically all the benefits of the greens. So it does help with the liver. 
and you can throw kale into soups and stews and there's a wonderful kale salad. And how you make kale salad, because kale's a bit tough, well you finely slice, finely slice the kale and you've got a big pile of finely sliced kale and then you sprinkle it with salt, Celtic salt of course, or Himalayan salt, and then you get your hands in and you rub. And you rub like this and you rub the salt all through the finely sliced kale and it limps. It almost looks like you've steamed it. And once you've done that, you've got about half the amount of kale you started with. And then you chop tomato and chop avocado and throw it through. It's delicious. And the kale is now tender. And yet it's a raw dish. So that's something you can try. That's, that's probably my favourite way to eat kale, is kale salad. Looks like I'm going to have to make it for tomorrow so you can taste it. Do you put anything besides avocado? A tomato. But it looks beautiful because it's now bright green and the, the creamy light green of the avocado and the bright red of the tomato, it looks beautiful. But the tomato and the avocado uh, taste-wise go beautiful with the kale. Yes, if you cook it, that's a very New Zealand word, we. Cook it a wee bit. <laughs> cook, cook it a little bit and uh, put a little lemon and salt. Yeah, it's very nice. And I, if I'm doing a soup or a stew, I'll tear it up or cut it up lightly and put it in in the last five minutes so it just limps. And that's very nice too. How much time have I got? Because I could spend a lot of time on comfrey. Comfrey is a remarkable herb. And comfrey has a growth stimulant, so don't put it in your garden. It will just take over because it's got a growth stimulant. Now maybe down here in Invercargill, with your cool winter months and lots of frost, maybe it won't get out of control because in the winter all the leaves go and the root remains but in the early spring the, the comfrey shoots up. Now comfrey contains a growth stimulant so wherever you apply comfrey it's going to stimulate rapid healing. Its nickname is knit bone because of its ability to knit bone and it can knit tendons and ligaments and tissues. In the spring and in the summer, the, the active nutrients from the comfrey are found in the new leaves. But in the autumn and in the winter, all the healing properties go down to the root. So if you use comfrey in the winter, you use the root. If you use comfrey in the spring and summer, you use the leaves. The smaller leaves are very, very potent. Now there's been um, there have been messages coming out through the media that comfrey is dangerous. Have you heard that? And it will cause liver damage. Well in her book, How I Can Use Herbs in My Everyday Life, Isabel Shepherd, she gives a whole section on comfrey and she tells the story of a farmer who bought an old cow, um, female cow, from the abattoirs. The, the cow was old, could hardly walk, and he was going to experiment on this old cow because the cow was going to die anyway. So all the farmer did was give it comfrey leaves and he wilted them. They'll wilt, you know, within an hour of picking so the cow could eat more. The cow got stronger and stronger and bigger and started prancing around the paddock and started to produce milk. And he said the cream on that milk was about a third of the milk. Why did he do it? To prove. <laughs> See, they say that comfrey will cause liver damage. That's all this cow ate. Didn't even eat any grass, just the comfrey. Incredible experiment. Sheep will eat it too. Sheep will eat it too, and sheep will not eat a plant that will hurt them, will they? It's a remarkable herb because it has a growth stimulant in it. It's got a growth stimulant, it's anti-inflammatory, so it gets the inflammation down and it's a lubricant. 
So it's excellent on bones. We had a lady, and I'll make this story very short, she broke her leg, she broke her tibia and her fibula, and she had a crushed knee. And we knew it was broken, because when we found her, she'd fallen off a bike, um, she's 56, the bone was not sticking through the skin, but it was poking up like a tent. Anyway, we had a guy there that knew bones, and he said, hold on, Katie, and he <laughs> realigned it, the ambulance came, took her away, and... Anyway, she was in hospital three weeks and they would not operate. They were going to do pins and plates on her because um, her leg was so swollen. And her husband was getting frustrated with this, so he brought her home and we brought her into my lounge room. And it was the winter, so we graded up the comfrey root every night. Every night we graded up the comfrey root, we made a poultice. You grate up the root and it goes like chewing gum. You see, it's got this lubricant in it and we'd make a poultice like I showed you the other day and then I'd pour a little bit of boiling water on it to soften it a bit and warm it and put it on the leg and I'd put it around the knee and also where the break was in the tibia and the fibula and we would pray over it, we'd say, Father in heaven, we don't know what we're doing here, but you do. Do you know that lady totally healed? It was incredible. We, she did not get out of bed for, I think it was five weeks and we kept, it, we kept it straight, but every night we'd put the comfrey poultice on it. And then after six weeks, she started to uh, walk with crutches. And then I think it was another two weeks and she started gingerly walk with a walking frame. And it was probably about three months and she was running. Now they told her she'd probably never walk properly again because it was such a serious break. Now that was probably the most serious thing that we have ever done. And the doctor, went, when she went back to the doctor, he said it mustn't have been broken. But there was an x-ray that showed it and the bone was nearly through big, uh, because it's unbelievable, isn't it? It isn't when you realise what comfrey does. Remember the three things? It has a growth stimulant. So whether it be bone or tissue or tendon or ligament or skin. Growth stimulant, it's a lubricant, excellent for joints and it also reduces the inflammation. So it, I told her that if I was going to talk about comfrey, I'd need a bit of time. It's a remarkable, remarkable herb. So we pick the leaves in the spring and the summer and I dry them till they're totally dried out in a warm oven and then I pound them up to a powder and I do that three times so I've got 50 leaves. So in my jar I've got 150 leaves. They come down to a fine powder the jar's this big, I fill it a third full, then I fill it with olive oil and I shake it and I let it sit for two months. And after two months, I strain it into a double saucepan and then I warm beeswax. I mix them together and pour it into jars. And you can ring Misty Mountain Health Retreat and get a jar of comfrey cream. It's dark green. When do you get time to do anything else? Oh, that's one of my hobbies. <laughs> yes? Yes, comfrey would help, but for arthritis, the ginger poultice will take the inflammation out. Yes? So you, when you were telling the story um, about the broken bone, you applied that every day for three months? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, every day. Even when it looked like it was probably healed, we just still did it, we just still did it, we just still did it. Yep. And it's remarkable how it, how it healed. But I... I was on a plane one day and I was next to an orthopaedic surgeon. How I discovered this was because I'm platinum frequent flyer, I'm always up the front of the plane. So this guy was next to me and he had a suit on and he had a book in there and it said healing at a cellular level. So when I sat down I said that looks like an interesting book and he looked at me and said who are you? I said I'm Barbara O'Neill. What do you do? I said I'm a nutritionist and a naturopath and he went hmm. I said and who are you? He said, well, I'm Dr. Such and Such and I'm an orthopaedic surgeon. And I went, hmm. <laughs> anyway, now we're on a level ground, we began to talk. He said, you know, before we orthopaedic surgeons, bones healed. Hmm? Bones healed. The orthopaedic surgeon can't heal a bone. The body heals the bone. So basically, what the comfrey did, and I think if we didn't do the comfrey, I think it probably would have still healed, but not as quickly. <laughs> the, the comfrey boosted up and I was giving her high nutrition. 
In fact, this orthopaedic surgeon said to me, do you know, half of the surgeries we do are unnecessary. Whoa. I said, well, what I do is I teach people to look after their bodies so they don't get to you. He said, good. <laughs> he said, I don't do unnecessary surgeries, but he said, many do. He said, they've got to pay the bills. Oh, think about that. So how nice if we can keep our body strong and healthy. I said to him, well, if I get a broken bone, I'll come and see you. He said, I won't see you. Because <laughs> he knew. He said, I got these women in there. Knees are breaking up. He said, they're very overweight. He said, I, they insist, so I do knee replacement. He said, I don't know how that knee's going to ever heal with all that weight on it. He said, we have a hard job. And I agree, they do have a hard job. They do the best they can, but how nice if we can actually give our body the condition so it's strong and healthy, and if there is an injury, it will heal. And these herbs help, and the poultices help, and the hydrotherapy helps. Remember, it is the body and the body alone that can heal. I thank God for the healing powers of the body, but I also thank him for these herbs. <laughs> and I thank him for the poultices, and I thank him for the water therapies. So I'm going to give everyone a break now. It is 25 to 11, and we're going to come back at quarter to 11. And when we come back, we're going to be doing the the sodium bicarbonate wrap. Get inside. Well, well, well. That was so much food for thought. So much food for thought. And we just want to say thanks again for the knowledge that we have gained this afternoon. Um, she mentioned several herbs. Can anybody name a few that she mentioned? The comfrey. She mentioned the comfrey. The ones that she really spoke about or discussed. One of the, one of the ones she mentioned was the, this Right, the dandelion, she mentioned the aloe, she Singing mentioned the, the sorrel, she mentioned the radium, she mentioned the chickweed, and, and the first one, she, yes, and the first one she mentioned was the stinging nettle. Is anyone familiar with any of these? I, I am familiar, very much familiar with yeah. the aloe, the dandelion. And the, and the, the dandelion. You know, I have that. I have yeah, and she mentioned the aloe. Yes, and I, I, as I was saying, I, I have um, dandelion growing wild in my yard, but for some reason, I was never really, you know, interested in, in, experimenting, on it. I didn't take the chance, but I think I can do that now that she gave some insight into it. And one of the herbs that I use a lot too is the aloe. That's my medicine. I don't do without aloe, but I, what, I did, what I do, some, I don't use all of the, 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 the outer leaf. I use just some of it, but I blend that and I blend it with pure orange juice. And that's my medicine. Aloe blended with orange juice and that is what i take as my medicine but let's let's take a look at some of the things that she said about some of these herbs that she she mentioned and one of the things she said about the stinging nettle how we need to identify them she also said that they are used they can be used in a stew or they can be used as spinach but very importantly she says that it has a sting and I was wondering how close it is to um, to call that weed. I'm going to get the name in a while. But she spoke about this sting that is removed. And she said that she had the experience of the sting. And what she used was the dock. She said she used the dock. And that dock was the remedy that she used for the stinging nettle. And she said that she chewed it. And then she spit it out in her hand 
and she was able to squeeze into hold. And that is what really helped her to overcome that um, stinging nettle. So is the juice. So you can either chew it, but I would prefer to put it in my hands and I would prefer to rub it, you know? When you rub it, you get the juice and the juice is what helps with the stinging nettle. But I guess a lot of people might be afraid to use the stinging nettle, seeing that it has that, that sting. But she said that the sting is removed once you have cooked it, you know, you put it in a stew and you cook it and the sting is being removed. Sister, um, Sister Lucas. Yes. I, I, are you talking about poison ivy? Yes, yes. I was talking about poison ivy. Thank you so much for the name, sis. I was wondering if it's the same thing. No, uh, poison ivy um, is different. The leaves are like smooth and it's shiny, very shiny. So it's oh. not, the stinging nettle come from the, the spikes in the leaves. Yeah, that, okay. yeah, the spikes. And when the spikes, you know, catches your hand, um, you know, it kind of sting it like a like a bee sting, like a yeah, sting. Say like an ant. Like an ant, ant like yeah, an ant, yeah, ant, you know, bite, oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, sister. And she also said that with, with the stinging nettle, that the roots go deep down in the earth. And because of that, they are able to access the minerals from the soil. So that, that's one thing she said about it. Also, what she mentioned that the stinging nettles can be used as a broth. We call it stock back then. Stock is the liquids from which vegetables you know, are cooked. And sometimes what, whatever vegetables or remaining foods that you have, you put it in a pot and you boil it up and you can use it for your soups and your sauces and for your gravies. And, and that mineral that is found in the stinging nettle, because she said you can also, maybe for the last half an hour, you can place some of the stinging nettle into that, into that broth or that stock. And when you do that, you find that the minerals from the stinging nettle will get into the stock. So after then you can just probably remove it. You know, of course, you're gonna add some Celtic salt to, to that stock. Can I just say something, please? Yes, go right ahead. This is Sister Bernard. Yes, in, my in my village where I came from, yeah. that same thing that she had there, we call it scratch bush. Oh. And when our children had teething problems, it is the root that we boil to give our children that had teething problem. We boil the tea and give it to them and that solved all their teething issues. Wow, thank you for that information. She will also mention about the tea, the nettle tea. And she said it's good for people who are suffering with anemia. So that can also make a tea. So probably that's the same thing. And you see in different cultures, different um, herbs will have different names. So you might not be familiar with a particular name, but you might be familiar with the particular herb, but just that it carries a different name. And then she went on to the chickweed, spoke about the chickweed. And she said it's similar to the radium. And one little root, she says, can spread because it's a plant that spreads. It can take over the entire place if you allow it to. And uh, how can you identify that? She mentioned that you can break the stem and the thread, the thread, you will see a thread that is there. And that thread is what hold, that, hold the pieces together. And she also mentioned that for the chickweed, I'm sure that some of us are familiar with the chickweed, she, can, she said it can be placed in soups and it can be placed in stews. And very importantly also is that it's an anti-itch herb. So she said that you can make a tea with it and you can put it in the refrigerator using ice cubes. And when the itch starts, you can take that cube and you can rub it and it is going to soothe. It's going to soothe the itch. She also says that you can make a, um, a chickweed bath, you know, if you're all itchy, you can make a bath and you can be, you can use it as a bath because it also has antifungal properties. 
no, sorry, not, not that has the antifungal properties, the coconut oil. She said you can mix it also with some coconut oil that has the antifungal properties. And it can be, she also said it can be eaten. I don't know if anyone have ever experienced eating, eating chickweed. Anyone has ever eaten it, tried it? No. I haven't. But I, I, I'm, I'm so scared of bees because sometimes you, it's good to, to, to go around and you look at bees and try to identify them and try to research them and to see their, 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 their uses because so many, so many weeds, we call them wild bush, you know, but a lot of weeds are growing around our homes and in our neighborhood and we just pass them. But I believe that God gave us these herbs for a reason and for a purpose, because if he says it's for the healing of the nations, there must be something in some of these weeds that we, we, we pass by and we don't think anything about them until later somebody discovers the use and then they make it into a medicine and then you have to pay for it and so much money you have to pay just to get it. But we need to research, as I said, research your weeds, try to find out what are their, their medicinal purposes. And then she spoke of the, the radium and she says that that, that one also, it, sorry, it looks like the chickweed, but it does not spread out like the chickweed when you- It grows like it. a tree. It grows like a tree, yes. And then she says that um, how to identify it is that when you break it, it white gives milk. off it gives off a white milk, and it's an it's an irritant. So she's cautioned that you need not put it in your salad. Don't put it in your salad, right? Because the milk that milk can be put on um, things like skin cancer, or if you have a wart, or if you have a mold and it's going to burn it off. Mm -hmm. And before you apply it, she says you can put a little oil around the infected area or the, the area, put a little oil around it, and then you apply that, that milk. And what, what she also said was that the thicker the stem of the radium, the more the milk that you're going to get from it. So it's very good when you come to things like the wart and your cancer and your burns. Use that and it's going to help to burn it off. I've never seen that herb radium. I don't know if there's another name for it, but I don't think I'm familiar with it at all. But we can always find out, research, go Google it, look and see what the pictures, uh, the pictures look like, and then try to see if you can identify those particular herbs. And then she spoke also of the sorrel and she, she drew a diagram and she said that it, it has two lobes at the bottom and it has a sweetish, bitterish taste. And it's a very green herb, she says, and that it's very high, very high in cholesterol. And better, um, bitter, it's a bitter herb and it's also good for the liver. And its, its molecular structure is similar to that of the human, um, the human blood. And then she also also draw, drew diagrams of what the human blood looks like and the plant blood. The plant blood contains the magnesium, where the human blood contains the iron. Contains iron. She says that it can also be used in your green drinks. Make a juice, and you can you know, use that because it, it has to do with the, it increases the potency. And then she went to one that is very familiar to us. That's the dandelion. And uh, she mentioned that it's, it's, it has some short, sharp corners. And it, many times it grows on one stalk. There's a one stalk and it's one, just one stalk in the center. But she said, don't put it in your drinks for whatever reason. Don't put it in your drinks. It has sharp edges also. Uh, and um, the leaves are more round. Oh, this is when she compared the dandelion with the um, catsia. And she says one, the leaves are, one, one leaf is rounder than the other. One has uh, yellow flowers. Dandelion is also smooth. And it is known as the king of the herb garden, the king of the herb garden. So I guess it 
it is it has several uses maybe that is why they call it the king the king of the the, the herb and uh, the king of the herb garden because when you think about lions you think about them being strong you know and um She's also mentioned that it helps the liver to regrow because it's a stimulating herb. It's a stimulating herb and so it helps the liver to regrow. And it is used, so some people use it in their potato salads and the root, the root can also go very deep in the soil. And she says in order to get it to the, the best of it, you can add some wood chips around it. And that is going to keep help the development of the plant. Also, she said that you can roast the 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 um the stem or the roots. I think it's the root. You can roast the root, and you can <clears throat> use that root in teas. You can use it to make chai chai dandelion. So that's another use. Roast the roots. And maybe you can keep it because the roots, of course, once it's roasted, it's gonna last for a while. And that can be used as teas for making teas. And one of the very popular ones she spoke about, and we are all familiar with the aloe vera. I had such a big plant when I was living back in the, in the Caribbean. As a matter of fact, I had several plants and I used to use this for so many things. And I remember so many times, and even now I do it, whenever I'm doing the aloe, I take off a piece of that green, green skin and I rub it on my face. I just keep rubbing it, rubbing it, rubbing it on my face. And you can feel the pull after a while. You can feel, feel that pull on your face. So it also helps to tighten, also helps to tighten this, this skin. She encouraged everyone that every home should have, should have a plant and it's not difficult to grow. Because when you have a large plant, you, just, you see so many times that the little ones are just budding from the side. They're just budding. And she gave an experience also when she had to use that slime. The slime also, it heals the, the, the lining of the gut. That is why sometimes people just cut a piece of the, the, the aloe and they just throw it down their throat. But I find it very difficult to do. And that is why I blend mine so I'm able to drink it. And also the older ones are, are the most potent. So the larger the plant, the more potent it is. And then also she mentioned that um, she uses really, you know, sometimes some people just focus on the meat on the inside and they throw away that, that leaf, but that leaf also is good because under that leaf also, what you're gonna find is a yellow sap and that can be very, it's an irritant to the gut. And so that is why sometimes when you, when, you, when you cut the bottom of the aloe, you see that yellow juice coming out. And that is what she doesn't recommend that you use because as I said, it's an, as she says, sorry, it's an irritant to the gut, to the gut. I can pause there for comments before I continue the last part of it. Anybody would like to share anything about the aloe or any other? herb that they learned about this evening. Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you must have learned um, something. Yes, sis. Um, I use the dandelion. I chop it up and I um, season it and cook it like spinach. And yeah. Um, yes. yeah, cook it like spinach and eat it. It's very nice because when you, you know, put your onions, garlic, in it and um you know and a little bit of um the celtic salt and um like a tablespoon of um olive oil um i it, cook it really nice cook it down nice like spinach and that's how i use it as well as i use it in my green juice as well anyone else ever tried thank you so much dr moore anyone else ever tried using any of the herbs yeah, dandelion, um, I use it regularly. Um, I try to grow dandelion in my sister's garden. And she has it on her lawn, but that probably was sprayed, so I didn't use that. I got one and I planted it in her garden. 
and the groundhog did oh. not eat the one that is on her lawn because it sprayed but they went to the garden and they ate the one that was planted in the garden oh boy well they have to eat as well <laughs> so they will find whatever food is they can eat and they were going to use it too but it's and amazing then, that they didn't they didn't touch the one that was spread but they ate the one in the garden maybe maybe the one that the spread gave off a particular scent that did not you know that turned them off so they didn't eat it okay so we continue and then she also mentioned that the um the aloe vera gives off the polysaccharides and they they help to stimulate stimulate the um the cells which help to ch it checks the cancer cells it helps to check with the cancer cells and she also mentioned that you can take the leaves and you can you can put it in water and you can drink it and the, the longer you leave the aloe in the water the thicker the, 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 the content is going to be and you can drink it and it also has a natural probiotic property it also has vitamin b12 and you can also dehydrate it you know put it in put it to dry and you can you know have it for for use for future use and then there were some questions that some um, students, I guess, they were asking. But she also mentioned the comfrey. Is anybody familiar with the comfrey? Yeah. Back home, we, we, we grew that. But um, I've not seen it here. I've just, just in pictures. But um, I, we grew that at home when we were back home in our yard when we were back home. Okay. Because she mentioned, she said it, it's a growth stimulant and it, it helps with rapid healing. It helps to knit back bones and, and tissues and the nutrients are also found in the new leaves because during the winter, the, the, the nutrients are stored in the root. But when it's springtime, you find these fresh leaves come up and those are the best ones to use. It's also anti-inflammatory. And she mentioned, she mentioned a story about the cow that was sick and ate it because some people said it's not good to eat, but she said that the cow did eat it and it made a complete recovery. And she also mentioned that it can be used as a poultice, you know, make the poultice. And she mentioned that she treated someone that had um, a knee problem and she used that made it into a poultice. I can't remember what she said she made the poultice with, but she's also said that you can make a cream with it, and the comfy and the wax and a few other things that she mentioned, and that can be also used as a cream. So that's about it for this afternoon. I don't know if anyone else would like to add anything about it. Somebody mentioned the doc in her presentation she said it's a green herb and that the stem of the stinging nettle is is good for for the for the sting Some, somebody mentioned that, that the stem of the stinging nettle is good for the stem and somebody also mentioned the milkweed the milkweed is also good for when you have that stinging nettle she said it can be blended put some edible herbs in the blender and you can you can blend it it's not every herb that you see you can use you have to make sure that you research it before you use it and if you're not sure about it i don't think you should use it make sure you research it and so many times you know we drink and drink and drink all these herbs and sometimes we don't it's not that they're bad they're not bad but sometimes we misuse them and we don't know because sometimes it's not every herb you can mix one with the other and so you have to be very careful and that is why sometimes you've got to make sure that you are aware of what you are doing because yes indeed they are all good but if they are misused or if they're abused they can do the body harm um one thing that i noticed sister lucas yes is that um and i noticed this in my sister's garden 
is that if you have a good plant that is growing, a lookalike comes right beside it. And mm -hmm. if you are not careful, you can mistake the, the bad weed for the good one. Because the, both of them are growing together and they look mm -hmm. so much alike that if you, have, you have to be able to really identify the good one to know the difference between the good plant and the and the look alike so that's why i am a little wary in you know picking plants if i'm not extremely sure mm, yeah you know you know getting plant from the wild i would rather i would rather buy it online because are are somewhere you know i have i have a place mountain rose herb where i i I buy my herb because I am just so afraid of you know going out in the wild apart from the pesticide that is used but I'm just so afraid of going out in the wild and just picking the you know the wrong plant the yes. look-alike yes and you have you have to be so careful because when you think you're picking one that is good you're picking one that is bad and indeed some of them look so similar I think she mentioned two of them that look very familiar I think it was the stinging nettle and some other one. They look so similar. Anyway, so um, very careful. She said that dandelion looks like cat's claw. The cat's claw, yes. And yeah, the dandelion. dandelion. They look alike. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we have to be very careful, you know. But we thank God for knowledge and we know that the herbs are for the healing of the nation. But as we said, that we have to be very careful and be wise. It's not every, 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 you know herb you see in the yard you're going to pick up and say oh, i'm going to try this without researching it and knowing what are the, 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 the um what are the, the the value of these particular plants so and, um, gonna... since, um to to identify most of our herbs we can um, download google lens on our mm -hmm. on our um phones and then google lens can identify most of those plants for you you know, yeah, those it's herbs. important yeah. that we do that. It's important that you do that. Google it, and then you're able to see the get, get a, a picture of what it looks like. Also, it's not only the your written information, but you want you want to see what a particular herb looks like, and then you can match it with the ones that you might have in your yard. As I said at the back of my yard, that's a lot. I call them wild bush. They're just growing wild, and I don't go too close. The other day, I went. To the to the at the back of the yard. As a matter of fact, I was doing some gardening, not realizing that I was close to that poison ivy, and so it it dealt me a blow. <laughs> but I thank God. I thank God for healing. I thank God for healing. So we have to be so careful. I didn't touch it. I didn't realize that it was close by. And you know, sometimes you touch, you brace, you lean on it, and then it affects your skin. But we have to be so careful. So we just want to thank God again for the presentation this evening. I pray that you were all blessed, truly blessed, and that you would have learned something about the herbs that were presented this evening. So thank you again for joining. And at this time, we will close with prayer. I'm going to ask Sister, Sister Drisdale to close us off in prayer. Let us pray. Kind, loving, compassionate Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your goodness. Father, we thank you for the plants which you have given us for the healing of the nation. Because Lord, sometimes when we get sick and we pray for a miracle, your Holy Spirit points us to something simple that we can use. So Lord, we thank you for this knowledge. Help us to use it wisely and help us, dear Lord Jesus, to share this information with others. Father, we thank you for Barbara O'Neill and we thank you for this program. Oh Lord, we pray that more people would come out and just understand the importance of being able to use these herbs, dear Lord Jesus, just to keep well. Be with us, Father. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us, Lord, to know that you love us with an everlasting love. So, Father, 
we thank you again for all the good gifts that you have given to us, including the Sabbath. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Sister Drosdale, for the closing prayer. So at this time, we're going to close. I just want to say thanks again for joining. Do join us again next Sabbath for another presentation. Also at 6 p.m., please remember, it's Vespers. So do join again as together we worship our Lord and Creator as we bring the Sabbath.